so easy to measure CO2 from space because the signal is very weak. We're working on such a mission and I think this will be one of the most important ones for me personally. Hey Space Watchers, it's Chiara Monter here, event coordinator in our Space Watch global team. End of May this year, I had the pleasure to attend the Living Planet Symposium in Bonn, Germany, the largest Earth observation conference in the world. Now, on the topic, who better to talk to than Robert Meissner, Earth Observation Outreach and Phi Experience Coordinator at ESA. Robert took me through the process of Earth observation, explaining, for example, how the data goes from a satellite all the way to your weather forecast at home, why Earth observation is so important, and what challenges are facing it at the moment. This is Space Cafe Radio, your channel about trends, cool people and real conferences. Now, let's dive right into our conversation. Enjoy! We are currently here in the big exhibition hall right next to the ESA stand. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you explain to us what does Earth observation do for us, just individuals here on Earth? Well, this is a very general question. First of all, maybe we should talk about what Earth observation is. We are looking at our planet from space. It's the best vantage point for understanding what's happening on our planet for several reasons. One is that we can look at the whole globe. And if you look at the vast areas that are close to the poles, Antarctica, Arctic, but also the big rainforest areas, deserts, areas which are not easy to get to, also maybe for political reasons. So getting data on our planet, on the land surface, on the oceans, also on the atmosphere, is vital for understanding what is happening on our planet and how we are influencing the changes that we and we observe these changes and we see them and we have all the facts in our hand that prove how we're influencing our planet and we need to understand why this is happening and we need to understand in which extent this is happening so we need to make it a quantitative analysis rather than just saying it's changing that's very comprehensive Okay, then let's maybe dive more into how it's done. Because you mentioned before that there are different types of satellites for different things. Can you maybe explain some of them, please? Well, we have different satellites which serve different purposes. If you want to look at the weather, and weather forecast is one of the most important applications in Earth observation. 80% of the accuracy from the weather forecast comes from satellites. So it would be a lot worse if we wouldn't have it. And it's not about going to the beach. It's about stepping on a plane going on a boat, being a farmer, knowing what to expect in the next days. That's very important for our economy. That's very important for every one of us. Look at the forecasts we had last week for the heavy storms in, in Central Europe. But we also have other satellites because for weather, it changes very fast. So you need an every image every half an hour, every 15 minutes to be able to understand what's happening. Whereas if we're looking at agriculture, if we're looking at changes in the land surface, in ice, the changes are much slower. So there may be sufficient to have it an image, a data set every two, three months, every two, three weeks, depending on what you want to look at. And for every one of these applications, we have specialized satellites that help us do exactly what they need to do. And now from a layman's perspective, you have the satellite that is observing the weather that does this very quickly, very continuously. What happens with the data it collects? Where does that go? How is that then applied? Well, again, it depends a bit on the satellite we're talking about. But let's talk about weather satellites. And weather satellites, of course, it's important that you have an image very frequently, every 15 minutes. But it is also important that you get this data to the people because it, nothing gets old as fast as an old satellite image. So they are transmitting the data down to Earth where we have big antennas or not so big antennas. It, again, depends on the satellite that receive the signal. And then we have a processing center where the data, which is coming down digitally, of course, is transformed into the readable data and usually also immediately transformed into data that people can use. And it's put directly on their desktops. In an ideal world, this happens in the matter of minutes. In reality, it can be more complicated, but that's not for the weather data. That's for other data, which needs calibration, which needs to be analyzed before it can be distributed to the people. So that may be a bit slower. But ideally, we have our data beamed to the ground, transmitted to the users within minutes. Now, on the topic of sustainability, because in the space sector, there are a lot of discussions about space debris, space traffic management. Does that affect Earth observation? Is there a saturation point right now where it's too many satellites or is that still promising? 
Well, I can only answer this from an Earth observation perspective. What is happening is that the recent events that happened, like explosions of satellites, but also space debris placement by old missions, which are still up in orbit, many of them are typically deposited actively or accidentally in an orbit which is between 600 and 800 kilometers above our heads, which is a relatively low Earth orbit. But that's where most of our satellites fly. So that's more the issue, that it's, a, it's an area which we use, which is quite popular. And the more popular something is, the more crowded it gets. We've had one incident in the last years that we know of, where one of our satellites solar panel has been hit by a micro piece. We're talking one, two millimeters, and it caused a roughly 20 centimeter dent in the solar panel, and we had a little bit of a power loss. It was not critical, but we see more and more that things like this are happening. I know this was also mentioned in the plenary sessions that for space in general, there's much more of commercial actors coming up. You have startups not only wanting to send up their own satellites, but also focusing more on the data analysis part. How is that collaboration? Do you work closely with a lot of the commercial actors? I think to answer in a more general way without defining commercial actors more in detail, this is exactly what we want. The Copernicus program, the European Earth Observation program called Copernicus, which is probably the biggest Earth observation program in the world, as far as number of satellites and amount of data goes, is aiming at exactly this. We're using basically taxpayers' money to build satellites to shoot them up and we make the data available to everybody who wants to use it. Environmentalists as well as political decision makers, but also people who are founding a business to what we call value add the data. The oil company, to put it blunt, doesn't want to know anything about the satellites. They want to know where they have to drill. Or if we have a flood disaster, for example, the help forces, they need to know, can I still pass this street? They don't care about the satellite data. So there are companies in between who provide services, iceberg services, another one, or the icebreakers in the Baltic Sea, for example. They're guided by our satellite data, and there are companies who are providing that information, not the data, to the people. And that's exactly what we're aiming at. There are also commercial players coming into the game who are, as you said, shooting up their own cell satellites. Elon Musk is one of them. And Planet, a company in the US. Uh, there are many players who are going into a niche market which is quite specialized but also quite interesting using very high resolution satellite data. Most of them with very high resolution satellites so that means you can see something on the ground which is like 50 by 50 centimeters and they also build fleets of satellites not one or two like we do but smaller satellites but many of them in the 50s in the hundreds and they do analysis, for example, for commercial purposes, looking at parking lots of big supermarket channels. So they see when, at what time there's the peak and thing. So they get independent comparable data from different companies. So that's a completely different concept. They have their own satellites and they provide all the services. So that's also a business model in Earth observation. Maybe as a final question, where do you see the future of Earth observation going? How is it going to develop in, say, the next five to ten years? I think that where we are going is a little bit more of the same because what we need is long time series. To monitor climate change, one of the key -ish data sources for monitoring climate change comes from space, from the Earth observation satellites. Looking at ice, looking at the atmosphere, CO2 concentrations changing, air pollution, all the things you see, environmental change on the ground, desertification. These are all things we can see from space, but we can also quantify them. But we need a very long time series. Only after 30 years do we see if it's a trend or if it's only weather. Like climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So it's not, it's 30 years of solid data that we can use to an analyze what's happening. And with most satellite missions, we're just now starting to get the 30 years time series because satellites do not exist for such a long time. And so I think we will have more of the same. We will need continuity of the missions. And on the other hand, we're developing new missions, which will help us understand better. One thing we cannot do in the moment is measure CO2 concentrations from space. But it's essential to understand who is emitting how much, or at least on a local scale, not on a building scale, larger industry areas, larger cities, it would be good to know how much CO2 are they emitting in which time and does it change. 
And we're working on building such a satellite because it's not so easy to measure CO2 from space because the signal is very weak. We're working on such a mission and I think this will be one of the most important ones for me personally, at least. What gets you most excited about Earth observation? Well, my job at ESA at the European Space Agency is everything related to visualization. So every long time series data set that I can get my hands on, which is good in the quality, no gaps, no gaps in time, no gaps in space, gets me excited still after over 30 years. Wonderful. That's how you know that you found your place. Thank you so, so much. This was the end of our episode, but please don't forget to check out our full program of Space Cafe Radio, where we offer interviews, insights and editorial comments on the space sector. Thank you all very much for listening. And with that, I leave you for today. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Bye.